I uh, subscribe to World Magazine. It's uh, basically a news magazine from a Christian worldview. And hey, they had an article about Baltimore this past week. And I didn't know this, but in 2015, uh, our city had the highest uh, number of murders per capita on record. 2016 was a close second. And um, just as recently as last April in Baltimore, homicides are up 60% from the same time last year. So, you know, you, it makes me wonder, you know, you think about Chicago, LA, other large cities that have become notorious for exorbitant homicide rates. Why is that? What is the problem? Is there a connection between uh, murder and poverty, uh, drug abuse? Maybe there's a connection between murder and the increased secularization that we see in our culture. So um, I, was, I, I read the article, I was thinking about that, and then I, I realized as I was going through Samuel that uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, somebody dies, somebody's murdered. So I thought I'd do a little bit uh, of a different kind of sermon today. And I want to talk to you about the Christian view of murder. Sounds very edifying, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's look at this. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. I don't, I don't think I'll take time to read the entire chapter, but uh, it says, When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, is the only surviving member of Saul's uh, sons, uh, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed. Uh, his courage failed. Literally, the Hebrew is his hands dropped. In other words, he just, it's like he gives up. And all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of the one was Baana. The name of the other was Rechab, sons of Rimon, a uh, man of Benjamin from Beeroth. For Beeroth also is counted part of Benjamin, the Beerothites fled to Gataim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, this is a now, now verse four is basically an, an increased additional note to emphasize the weakness of Saul's dynasty, the weakness of his house. So Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when, he, uh, when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So probably about this at this time, if uh, David has been reigning in Hebron for about four or five years, he could be nine or 10 years old. Now the sons of Rimon, the Berethite, Rechab and Baana set out. And about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came in the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. Then in verse 7, it's in typical Hebrew fashion, it's going to repeat what happened, but add a little bit more detail. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by way of the Arabah all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, this day on Saul and on his offspring. All right, I'll, I'll just stop right there. And let's, let's look to the Lord for a moment of prayer before we, we deal with this um, very tragic subject. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Um, we thank you that you are the God of life, that uh, this is eternal life, to know you and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And so, Father, I pray that you would, uh, as we think about the topic today, would you just renew in our hearts, a conviction about the sanctity of human life. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, um, first four chapters of Samuel. 
basically written in blood. Uh, somebody's killed in each chapter. A Malachite begins uh, to confess that Saul wasn't quite dead, so he finished him off when he saw that he couldn't possibly survive. Uh, and then in chapter 2, uh, Joab's younger brother Azahel is killed by Abner. And then Abner is killed by Joab in retaliation to that. And then, as we read just a moment ago, Ishbosheth, the last son of Saul, is murdered in his own bed. So, uh, not, not even to mention that after this, hundreds of men die in civil war, uh, brother against brother. So, where is David in all this, and what does this pertain to? The, how does this pertain to the kingdom? What are we to take away from this? Uh, that's what I want to talk about today. So, first of all, let's talk about why murder is wrong. Because if we say murder is wrong, we need to be able to say why it's wrong, right? So I want to begin by discussing just a little bit on the secular worldview uh, because, um, and I, I have to begin by, when you talk about the secular worldview, you have to admit that a couple of things. You have to admit that not all atheists and or secularists agree on the moral foundation of why murder would be wrong. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the reasons why sometimes I uh, will pull up online something that was written by Frederick Nietzsche or Oscar Wilde. It's because even though I'm at the polar opposite of those guys, they were, they were brutally honest about their belief system. And there, sometimes they can be very interesting in reading. Now, um, I think most atheists would admit, however, that apart from God, there's really no basis for objective morality. Um, I would say that a major tenet of secular humanism is that morality is never objective, that it, it's, uh, it, in the least, it's relative. And uh, I'll say more about that in a little while, but it's, it's, it just cannot be absolute. And we have to, before I go any further, let me just say this. Um, do you know, you, there are people that do not believe in God and that are completely secular that are decent moral people. We need to make that uh, agreement. We need to admit that. Uh, just like there are people who profess to be Christians who are not decent and who are indecent and immoral people. So uh, I just want to get that straight. But as far as the secular case against murder is concerned, it's basically built on uh, this first thing I want to talk about, and that is sec uh, societal stability. That murder is wrong because it's a threat to societal uh, stability. It would, if, if you say that, well, there's nothing wrong with murder and murder's okay, well, that's going to upset the social order. Society would quickly devolve into anarchy and only the strong would survive. You know, the weak would be vic victimized, exploited. And uh, sometimes I wonder if secularists don't all consider um, the Darwinian idea of survival of the fittest, I think some of them would say that's not necessarily a good thing. I think they would have to admit that. Um, because what they would say is that, well, we have evolved to the point where we have learned that life is better for us when we don't kill each other, when we work together for societal good. Uh, and they would even go so far as to say that our moral conscience is a evolutionary construct that developed over millions of years, okay? But they would reject the Christian viewpoint, which they call, and see, I don't really like this phrase, but this is what the secularists call our viewpoint, the divine command theory. Uh, and they reject divine command theory for, for basically two reasons. Number one, because of religious contradictions. So uh, religious morality, which uh, I say religious, which is another way of saying absolute morality, uh, is unreliable to the secularists because they think there's so much contradiction between religious systems. In other words, uh, apparently God has given these moral commands to some religions that conflict with other religions. And of course, it's the old argument, who's to say who's right? Okay? Um, Obviously, they mistakenly think that all religions spring from the same God. So, you know, 
they because in in their mind all these religions make these moral truth claims that contradict each other so they basically just have god painted over all of them but um okay so the secularists say that religious claims of morality uh, by by us as Christians are basically they boil down to our our um, opinions. That's you know they say well that yes okay, you can call it a religious belief you can call it a a, um, a religious moral value based on your truth claims, but as far as we're concerned it's an opinion, okay. And so they say, and they say that it's an opinion because all these different things contradict. And if all these things are contradicting, then obviously it's just your opinion because these contradictory things can't both be true. Well, that's absolutely right. Okay, so the second reason why uh, the secularists would disagree completely with divine command theory is because of religious, not only religious con contradiction, but because of religious corruption. Um, Best-selling uh, New York Times bestselling author Michael Shermer, he talks about this in his book, The Moral Arc, and he says, you know, uh, they, they, they say that um, absolute morality, which is what we have as Christians, we believe morality and truth is absolute. They, he would say, well, absolute morality corrupts absolutely. And uh, what he does, he argues this way. He says, okay, for all these religious systems, if you disagree with them, you are wrong and you're either, uh, you are condemned or you're not under our protection any longer. Okay? Everybody that disagrees with us uh, based on our moral truth claims are considered the enemy. Well, we don't look at people who disagree with us as the enemy. But you see, the, 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 one of the problems I have with seculars today is they're glittering generalities. But um, one of the things, of course, Shermer would point out would be the Crusades, right? The Crusades. What a horrible blot on Christian history, the Crusades. Um, they would, they would uh, point out also the Inquisition. They would point out the witch, witch hunts. They would point out all of the war and bloodshed that's been inflicted upon our planet in the name of God, Right? in the name of God. So um, I understand those arguments and um, I, I agree to some extent with some of their arguments because a lot of these guys are very, very intelligent guys. Um, you know, Christopher Hitchens is, has um, assumed room temperature, but I used to, you know, I don't do it anymore, but when he was alive, I used to love to listen to him talk. Um, I would love to listen, you know, people like Dan Dennett, Samuel Harris, um, Richard Dawkins, these are, these are, you know, pretty smart individuals and it's kind of entertaining. But usually as I listen to these guys, I get to a point where, ah, there it is. And it, you know, the sore is sticking out like a Thor stump, thumb, the, the flaw in, in their rationale. But to them, there would be no, um, to somebody like uh, Michael Shermer, there would be no difference between a crusader and a jihadist. Absolutely not. Uh, to him, both the crusader and the jihadist suicide bomber are operating on the basis of truth claims that have shaped their moral beliefs. Okay? And uh, Schirmer also points out that uh, Hitler, after all, was a Catholic. Well, really? You're going to go there? Oh, yeah, okay. Hitler was a good Catholic. I don't think anybody would say that. Okay? And he, he points out that Stalin was a Greek Orthodox. You know, both of those guys were nothing except demon-possessed um, maniacs that were bent on destruction. I mean, they, they were just terrible people. They were, how could anybody suggest that they were Christians? But that's one of those glittering generalities that I object to. But Shermer says, okay, there's not any real objective morality because, you know, it contradicts and it corrupts. And... He even goes to so far as to agree that even relative morality is not a good thing either because, as Nietzsche would say, it would lead to anarchy, you know, because there's no truth. There's no ab objective truth in this world. So uh, he is suggesting a third type of morality. 
And I think this is where a lot of secularists are gravitating today. So here it is. Uh, what is uh, provisional morality? There's objective morality and there's relative morality, both which he rejects. And he now opts for what he calls uh, provisional morality, which is this. Provisional morality is the belief that moral values are those that are true for most people in most cases most of the time. Okay? So that is called provisional morality. And he says we've reached the point in our evolutionary progress to where basically on the globe, there, most people have a set of moral beliefs that affect them in most cases most of the time. So, you know, if, if in our world today, then, if abortion is um, something that is true as something good for most people, in most cases, most of the time, then it becomes a good moral practice. Now, you know, it's, it's kind of frustrating to me, and I wonder if Shermer will live long enough to see the fallacy of some of his views, but uh, he, he is a very easy guy to listen to. Um, he's part of Skeptic Magazine, uh, and um, he seems like a really nice guy. So um, this is, I just wanted to present to you some of the ideas behind the secular uh, viewpoint on murder being wrong, because actually his take on it is a reaction to Dennis Prager of Prager University. If you watch the videos online, you know, Prager, Dennis Prager has said, apart from God, there is no objective morality, therefore murder cannot be wrong. And Michael Shermer took issue with that. So it's a very interesting conversation. But let me just talk about uh, the biblical worldview for just a moment. We say, as Christians, the Christian worldview says that our morality is based on the existence of a moral God. Okay? You know, that, that's why I kind of uh, do not agree with just labeling it divine command theory. Because to them, they say, oh, yeah, you say there's this God and it's wrong because he says it's wrong. Well, what is our basis of authority? The basis, and by the way, I hope you'll read what I put in the bulletin to, uh, for this week about Luther. Because the Reformation was based on the principle of sola scriptura, that the Bible is the final authority for us as believers in all matters of faith and practice. And the scriptures as our authority reveal God as a moral being. All right? He is good. He is righteous. He is just. He is holy. And this holy, righteous, good God has said, you shall not murder. All right? So it's not just to say, because well, God says we can't do it, so I can't kill you. Okay. It's more than that. Uh, we would say, apart from this moral being, there is no objective basis for morality for us. And so I would answer the secularists this way. Yeah, I agree with you that the Crusades were wrong. Uh, the Crusades, when I think about the Crusades, um, is that your phone? Yes. All right, let's all, let's all wait for Judy to answer her phone. It has to be her. Is this a piano? I just completely forgot where I was. Oh, we're talking about the secularists and the crusades. I would agree with them. Uh, on the, I, I think the crusades were wrong because they violated our Lord Jesus' command and his admonition to love your enemies. It's horrible, you know? Uh, I would also say that the Judeo-Christian set of values that I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that were grounded in some of the pre-Reformation theology, like you know, even in the 14th century with John Wycliffe, and then basically had a great influence on uh, Martin Luther himself, I would say that out of those principles, and, you know, I have to go back, This we, we could talk about this all day, in 1440 with Gutenberg's the printing press, actually being able to put the truth in the hands of the populace, that that is 
basically what led to the Enlightenment. And so I would say, and I think there's a legitimate article, uh, argument to say that our view of morality, our view of uh, basic human rights that led to the abolition of slavery, that led to restoring dignity to women, that uh, drove our, our uh, passion for freedom and personal liberties, those are, prince, those are based and came out of principles that sprung out of the Christian faith. If you know anything about the founding of our, our country, we, we know that it wasn't just the enlightened principles, but it was enlightenment principles that were generated by Christian truth. Okay. So you need to understand where we're coming from as, as believers. All right. So let's secondly, let's talk about when murder is not wrong. I want to approach it that way. I don't want to say when is murder right. Uh, I don't want to ever say murder is right, but there are times when murder is not wrong. You say, Paul, you just contradicted yourself. I know. Okay, so, but I, I generally speaking, let me just say it like this. Uh, taking life is wrong when it is not sanctioned by God. All right? Now, there are a number of examples of this in the first four chapters of 2 Samuel. Um, when murder is not thought to be wrong. The, the Amalekite that finished Saul off did not think he was doing something wrong. The two guys that murdered Esbosheth in his own bed did not think they were doing anything wrong. Uh, when Joab avenged his brother's death, he did not think he was doing anything wrong. Okay, so uh, let's 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 think about this, uh, and let me emphasize again that taking human life is wrong when it is not sanctioned by God. All right, so. Let's bring it down to where we live today, and I'll, let me point out several examples of this. First of all, euthanasia. Euthanasia is a, a word that comes from two Greek words, good and death. Um, basically, it's the concept of dying well, or dying good, or dying well. Uh, euthanasia, that's what the word literally means. And what we see now, and basically we think of it as mercy killing. So like the Amalekite who killed Saul, he says, when I saw that he couldn't survive, I went ahead and finished him off. Okay? Um, we are living in a world that has fully grasped the concept of right to die. And more and more in our country, uh, physician-assisted death or suicide is uh, taking hold. And what we're, what we're doing, we're living in a world that is sliding. Now listen carefully. We're living in a world that is sliding from the right to die to the obligation to die. Okay? In other words, it might be a good thing to end your own life rather than continue to live as a financial and physical burden on your family. So you know, maybe it might be good for you to go ahead and check out. Um, Charlotte Allen is a woman who wrote an interesting article um, about this from her experience checking into a hospital with breast cancer. And the pressure uh, that she felt about being somewhat, she would say, somewhat harassed into signing her living will. Uh, here, let me just, so you'll know where she's come from. Let me quote from the article in the Washington Post. She said this, and I quote, In fact, when I contemplate the concept of dying well, I cannot avoid the uneasy feeling that it is actually meaning dying when we, the intellectual elite, think it is appropriate for you to die. Consider what's happened in recent years. The classic Hippocratic Oath and its prohibition against physicians giving people a deadly drug has collapsed with the growing acceptance of such notions as physician-assisted suicide and the right to die, and even giving some very sick, disabled, or demented people a little push over the edge, as it seems to be the case in the Netherlands. By the way, um, that is where the grossest examples of this exist, where they are even euthanizing uh, little kids who are mentally retarded. Okay, so 
She goes on to say, people facing end of life decisions may well feel the subtle pressure from the medical and bioethical establishments to make the choice that will save the most money as well as spare their relatives and society at large the burden of their continued existence. Well, I don't know if she's a Christian or not, but that's where, I mean, I think her words reflect where we are in the United States as a culture. We're, we're part of that slide where the right to die is slowly becoming the obligation to die. The Christian worldview, however, would object that our time is in the hand of God. Our death is totally and completely at His discretion. He is sovereign. And He is the one who gives life. He is the only one that has the right to take it. So, you know, I'm just saying, be careful what you sign when you go to the hospital. You know, I have a living will. But we need to be, let me just say this now, you need to be really, really careful about what you're signing and um, make sure that it has uh, content that agrees with a Christian worldview. Uh, another thing, and I'm not going to talk about these things very much, but I'll just point out two real quickly, and then I do want to spend some time on the last point, but um, abortion, okay? Is that murder? Well, I personally believe it is. And why do I believe that? I believe that on the basis of what the Scripture teaches. Again, the Bible is our authority. God refers to unborn children within the womb as human life. In the Old Testament, if something happened to a pregnant woman, there had to be compensation. God says life for life. So, um, I believe that the unborn child is a human life uniquely designed by God. And then I also would go as far as to say this, that murder is actually a form of idolatry because it's putting somebody in the place of God. Somebody is taking God's prerogative away from him and assuming it for themselves. They're taking the place of God. So abortion, in a, in a similar sense, is the usurpation of God's authority that lets women, gives women the authority to determine whether or not their child lives or their child dies. You know, um, the Lord alone, again, has the authority over life. Job said the Lord gives after his 10 children were killed, tragically. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, God put up with the Canaanites and the Amorites for four centuries until their atrocities and their perversions were more than he could handle and the iniquity of the Amorite was full and God sent his people in there to decimate. To, to why? You know, so why would he, God give permission to kill women and children to, to end the perpetuation of such abominable practices and culture? God has that right. He's the sovereign God. He's the Lord of all life. God has the authority to take the life of everyone on the planet except eight people he put into the ark. Why? Because that's his prerogative as God and as a good God and as a moral being. All right. So uh, let me, let me uh, mention another. Uh, now, Joab did not think he was wrong when he took revenge and killed Abner for his brother's blood. Well, um, how did that work out for him? You know, technically, okay, when, when, when Abner was basically murdered by Joab in cold blood, you know, one, by the way, did you know, I didn't think about this until later on, but when you read the passage, Joab killed Abner in Hebron which was a city of refuge. And you know what a city, city of, you know how we need to think of it in our day, a sanctuary city. Hebron was a sanctuary city. So if you had killed someone by accident or with a justifiable homicide where it was, you know, you were not wrong to take that life, to protect yourself from the vengeance of family members, 
you could flee to one of the sanctuary cities, one of the cities of refuge, and you were safe there. But not, you were, here's the deal. You were never safe from Joab. I mean, Joab was, the, the, and by the way, when you read the first four chapters of uh, 1 Samuel, you see strong men and you see weak men. Ishbosheth was just a puppet. He had no strength. He was incompetent. He was just a puppet for Abner to manipulate. But um, Joab had no right to take Abner's life. Now, I don't think, you know, I don't think I need to say much about this, right? Because all of us would agree that vigilantism is wrong, that you don't have the right to take the law into your own hands. You don't have that right. Um, revenge is always, we've already seen this in 1 Samuel, revenge is always God's prerogative. That's why David will not lift a finger against Saul. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Uh, and this murder of Saul's son Ishbosheth was nothing less than a premeditated, cold-blooded, cruel act of murder. And the two evil thugs that killed him tried to justify it by saying it was God's vengeance. Well, as we will see, the king disagreed. Okay. And then the last thing where I think is an illegitimate taking of human life is suicide. And uh, again, I don't want to belabor this, but let me talk about it a little bit because we have another example here in the text. What about Saul falling on his sword? What about his armor bearer committing suicide, falling on his sword? Well, um, did you know there are seven examples of suicide in the Bible? And every single one of them is in a uh, situation that is unrighteous. They're either in unbelief. You know, the last one was um, Judas. Um, in complete unbelief and desperation and hopelessness and despair. Um, it's been said of suicide that it isn't just having a fear, no fear of death, but rather it's having a greater fear of life. You know, uh, there's this, um, uh, let me just say a word about this. There's this controversial series now on Netflix called 13 Reasons Why, and Judith and I watched the first episode last night, so I don't feel like I'm in a position yet to really speak with authority on it. But let me just say that there are some reports and uh, critics coming out, and they are saying that it projects suicide as a rational decision, and in a sense it does kind of glorify suicide, which if that's the case, and we've only seen one episode, uh, I think that would be an unfortunate thing. It concerns me um, that this programming now can be seen by any young person or child anywhere on any number of devices without any parental consent. That concerns me greatly. You know, there's a Florida school district that has already begun to notice students attempting suicide and, and hurting themselves, and their reasoning is based on this series. Um, you know, and you, you know when, what disturbs me and upsets me most about this is the adolescent tendency toward copycat behavior, um, so I think this whole series by Netflix is unfortunate and, you know, there are certain countries that have banned it. And well, I think that's kind of ludicrous because if you want every teenager in America to watch this, just ban it. Okay. So, um, anyway, here's, here's the thing about this, that I think we as Christians need to be sensitive to this issue that in our hearts, we need to demonstrate compassion and acceptance, especially to young people's. Uh, young people that are seem that they're unable to cope with the struggles that life has brought them and that we need to be ready with uh, support and with a message of, of hope and to let them know that they're not alone and that God loves them and that he's got a beautiful plan for their lives, you know. But let me say it again, suicide is self-murder. It is the unsanctioned taken, taking of human life. All right, so uh, euthanasia, uh, revenge, suicide, uh, these, are, these are things that are unsanctioned by God. So real quickly, let me close this out by talking about, well, when is it not wrong to take human life? I'm not saying when is it right. I'm going to just say when is it not wrong, all right? Uh, it is not wrong when it is divinely sanctioned, right? Right? 
The only time murder is wrong is when it is unsanctioned by God. The only time when it is right is when it is sanctioned by God. And there are three examples of this in the scriptures. All right. Number one, uh, for personal safety. This is, this is um, on an individual level. I'm going to talk about three levels. The individual level, the state level, and the national level. On an individual level, we have the right to protect ourselves when our life is being threatened. Um, you know, according to Jesus in Luke 22, there's a time for self-defense. As a matter of fact, Jesus said there's going to be a time when if you don't have a sword, you better sell your coat and buy one. All right? And, um, you know, when, when he was arrested in the garden, Peter, you know, yanked out his sword. Uh, if it would have been in our day, it would have probably been a Glock or, you know. But anyway, he pulls out the sword and he cuts off the servant uh, of the high priest, his ear. And Jesus says, no, 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 put the sword up. This is not the time. There is a time, because he'd already said, there's going to be a time when if you don't have a sword, you need to sell your coat and buy one. But this was not the time for self-defense because Jesus was willingly giving himself up to the sacrifice, right? But even under the law of Moses, if you want to take it back to Exodus chapter 22, listen, the word of God states it this simple way, that if a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed, all right? So if somebody breaks into your home, God says, and in an act of self-defense, you strike him and he's dead, you're not at fault. All right? His blood is on his own head. That was the law of Moses. So I think you can make a case from the Bible for self-defense. And I, could I take it just a step further? I would say that we as men not only have a right to defend our families, we have an obligation to defend, to defend our families um, and if, if that means taking the life of a perpetrator who threatens life and limb, hey, so be it. So be it. We'll do what we have to do to protect our families, right? Okay. And I think this, you know, I was waiting for an amen. Thank you for all two of those. Um, so anyway, so for personal safety on an individual level, on a state level, let's talk about societal stability, and we're going to talk about capital punishment. Now, I know there are a lot of intelligent people that disagree with me on capital punishment. I, you know, I kind of coming from the standpoint that the bleeding heart liberal crowd that oppose the death penalty, I think it's a demonstration of their lack of respect for the sanctity of human life. They would never say that, but that's how I view it. Um, life is so sacred that it demands if a, someone's life is taken by a person, that person's life must be taken. Uh, the, you know, the, this, even before the law of Moses came along, God laid down the principle in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed for God made man in his own image. Did you see that? What was God's rationale? That murder is an assault on the image of God. It's an affront to the sanctity of life. It is assuming a right that God has not given you. So in Romans 13, we see that God gives government the sword of execution. Um, and here it's even added to uh, the, the rightness of it to say that God's given it to human government as a deterrent against murder and violence. Unfortunately, I think it's a terrible tragedy in the United States of America that our system of jurisprudence has put so many restrictions on the process that it's basically obliterated the deterrent aspect of capital punishment. Um, so, okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. So I think um, it is not wrong to take life in cases of self-defense, personal safety, also in, for societal stability as a deterrent against murder and violent crimes. And then last of all, on a national level, for our national security. And this brings in the, um, the prospect of war. So let me just answer the question as I see it from the scriptures. Should Christians be pacifistic? You know, I've read a book about this where I was reading this guy's book 
um, about human government and different stuff. And I, I was agreeing with everything he said till he got to the last point. And it's like his big climax of the book. Then therefore we all must be pacifists. I don't see that. I disagree with some of his conclusions and I don't see any indication in the new Testament that God forbids, uh, taking life in times of war. So, you know, Cornelius, to whom was the first Gentile to whom the gospel came, was a centurion. I think it's interesting that God chose for the first Gentile family to hear the gospel was a guy employed by the Roman army. So, um, and I think some of the greatest uh, forebears in American history have been devout Christian men who fought bravely for their country, whether it be George Washington, a devout Christian man, or somebody like Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson, for that matter. Uh, and you think about when those soldiers came to John the Baptist, for what? To receive the baptism of repentance. And they said to John, what do you want us to do? John said what? Okay, here's what you do. You guys, if you're going to repent, turn over a new leaf, then you've got to quit taking advantage of people. Don't exploit your power over people. And also be satisfied with your pay. Don't gripe about your wages. That's all. He didn't tell them. He didn't order them. Now that you have repented, you must stop soldiering. He didn't say that. So I don't think there's a case for pacifism in the New Testament. Rather, I think even the Apostle Paul used military metaphors as a description for how we're to live as Christians. All right. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. There are a number of issues that come up about war in our day and age that I think we need to address. And here's the question. This, this will be something I think your, your small group should talk about. And that is, do just war principles still apply in this age of terror? Do just war principles still apply? Ooh, I, we should even clarify it more, than, but we should say this. Do just war principles still apply in America? All right. Now you say, well, Paul, what do you, what do you mean when you talk about just war? Just war theory is that moral principles determine when we go to war and they determine how we war. Okay. So that's just war theory. Just war theory is the proposal that going to war is to be guided by moral principles that determine when we go to war and how we do it, okay? For example, um, those principles would suggest that war and taking life, therefore, in war would be justified when it is a defensive measure. In other words, I believe that as a country, we have a right to go to war when there is an aggressor that threatens our national security. If there is hostile aggressors out there that are, are intent on killing American citizens, then I think the United States has a just cause as for, for going to war. Also, I would add to it this. I think going to war should also, and this is not me, but this is just war theory. Part of it is it has to be the last resort. In other words, um, I think it is a totally moral thing to try to use avenues of diplomacy and perhaps restrictions on trade, you know. Uh, I, I can understand that. And that we should only take military action from a defensive posture for our national security after we've exhausted these other aspects of trying to resolve the problem. Okay? So as a last resort. Uh, another thing about just war theory is it should always seek to protect civilians, particularly women and children. And it should only be uh, legitimate when it has been, when war has been declared by a legitimate governmental authority. In other words, um, I don't think Americans have the obligation to go fight a war if that war has not been legitimately declared by constitutional authority. Ooh, we could really get into that one, couldn't we? Okay, so, um, uh, you know, and, and another thing, uh, there are a lot of people 
that are confused about our military involvement in various places of the world. Of course, you understand why. I mean, and we could talk about these things. For example, should Bashar al-Assad be allowed to uh, basically to kill civilians, to, uh, I mean, women and children? Uh, should he be allowed to poison his own people through chemical warfare? Should he be allowed to target hospitals? Should he be allowed to con uh, conduct mass executions, which he has done? Should he be allowed to resurrect that old ancient tactic of siege warfare? Like he did in Aleppo, where you basically cut off food and water and starve and thirst the people to death? I mean, who starves women and kids? So you say, well, do we have a right to, to stop him from doing that? Well, we could talk about that. All I'm saying, these are very troubling things and evidence that we live in a fallen world. What is the answer to this? What is the answer to this? The answer is always the same, Jesus. Now we think about the Middle East conflict and I'm gonna ask Tim to pull up this video since we, I didn't have time to show in the first service. I think it's like six or seven minutes long. I just want you to hear the testimony of this guy who was brought up in a Palestinian family. And uh, I want you to hear his testimony, how it relates to what I'm saying about Jesus being the answer to global conflict. I think about, okay, what, what do we take away from 2 Samuel as far as this, this difficult topic is concerned? What do we take away from it? I think there are a number of things to take away from it. First of all, in every situation where these four murders take place, David is exonerated. All right, that's number one. In every situation, what the writer and the narrator of the story is doing, he is showing you that David has come to the throne and he has come to the throne righteously without any treachery. He has been exonerated from any kind of wrongdoing. That's what the writer is doing here, showing how David's hands have no blood on them. All right. Secondly, it is also showing that David is saying, look, the period of judges is over. My kingdom is not going to be a time when everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. My kingdom is going to be established in righteousness and justice. And, you know, in this we see Jesus in him, uh, you know, in the kingdom of God today, we live under the law. You say, under what law? We don't live under the law. Well, yes, we do. We live under the law of Christ. Samer lives under the law of Christ. You and I, we live under the law of Christ. What is the love of Christ? To love one another, even to love our enemies. And um, in these situations, the Amalekite, who thought he was righteous in what he did to Saul, he found justice at the hands of David. Joab will eventually find justice. The murderer of Ishbosheth, how did things go with him? The king exercised justice. And in David, we see a type of Christ, the king, who is going to come. And he is going to come and he is going to exercise justice in this world. And the Bible says, for example, let me read just briefly Isaiah 11. With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. So, you know, there are a number of takeaways from this that... The law that we live under in the kingdom is to love one another and even to love our enemies. And that the kingdom is established in righteousness and justice. And then one other thing that I'll say in, in, in closing is this. David's patience in this book is remarkable because you've noticed over time, David does not lift one little finger to put himself on the throne. He knows that God has anointed him to be king over Israel. Yet, when he's given the opportunity, each time he's given the opportunity, 
He resists. His attitude is, if God wants me on the throne, the God who anointed me to be king, in his own time and in his own way, he will establish me as king. That's exactly what God did. And I think like our Lord Jesus, who was offered a shortcut to the kingdom, remember when he was tempted by the devil and showed him all the kingdoms. And Satan said, all of these are under my authority, but I'll give them to you. All you need to do is fall down and worship me. Jesus refused, resisted the temptation and said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. And then later on, when Jesus was uh, working his miracles and feeding 5,000 people besides the, men and, uh, besides the women and kids, uh, the Bible says they were going to come by force and make him a king. What did he do? He got out of town. He left. It wasn't, that was not the way God wanted his kingdom to be established. And even when he's on the cross, and the religious leaders dare him to come down and they would receive him as their king. They would finally believe him. All he would have to do is step off of the cross. He refused because it was not his way. It was God's way and God's timing. And in God's time and in God's way, he exalted Christ to the right hand of the majesty on high. So in this this troubled age in which we live, we need a Christian worldview about why we believe what we believe and how it works in our life. And when we do that, and when we open our heart to King Jesus, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna be like Samer. And God, that day when those Jewish Christian kids washed his feet, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, washed all of the hatred out of his heart. What a beautiful thing. Jesus is always the answer. That's why Hannah Kate's going to China, because Jesus is the answer. They don't need to change the government. They just need Jesus. So my challenge to us all today is let's, let's live under the law of the love of Christ. Love our enemies. And by the way, love them enough to do what that Christian with the Bible did and just walked up to this Arab coming out of a refugee camp and gave him a Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see that uh, in, in the affairs of this life, sin and its evidence is every, everywhere. And we're so glad that because we know you, Lord, we have a moral compass. We have a foundation for morality that Jesus satisfies all the questions about meaning and why we're here and where we're going and where we came from. And Lord, I pray that we might be so rooted and grounded in what we believe and why we believe it that you would make us effective witnesses for you in this world. And before I close my prayer, could I just ask everybody today as Christians, would you commit yourself again to the mission that Christ has given us to love this world enough to tell them the truth? Right now in your heart, would you, would you maybe recommit to that? Lord, I pray that you would make faith family a great lighthouse for the gospel. A light that shines from this place, not just in this community, but around the world for Jesus. For it's in his name we pray.